Thank you very much for staying with us on Global Dialogues. I've been speaking with Jose Vinils, Chairman of Standard Chartered Bank Group, and of course, uh, an extremely well-known economist, both at the IMF, at the Bank of Spain, and uh, uh, for his knowledge of uh, global economics. Well, uh, Dr. Vinils, thank you very much for your patience. Well, uh, you know, how would you s uh, look at uh, smart money moving? Do you think smart money or funds, big funds, will be willing to come to Asia, Asian countries like India or Indonesia, uh, despite you know, there being a risk off in global markets, in uh, developed markets? Well, I think so, and we're already seeing this. After uh, you know, our first uh, half of the year, where we had significant uh, outflows in terms of portfolio funds from, from India, we have had uh, six billion of inflows yes. in the month of August. And that is something which reflects very well on uh, the uh, understanding that investors have about the future uh, prospects of India. As I was saying one moment ago, uh, Indian growth prospects are uh, excellent, you know, 7%, I think 7% or around that this fiscal year, and for 24 fiscal years, some moderation to 5.5% or so. And uh, what we're seeing is that the actions that have been uh, put in place by the government over the last few years in order to increase the ease of doing business, in order to improve infrastructures, in order to, you know, the bankruptcy law, the clean up of the banking system, all of those things have contributed together with the significant sort of improvement of infrastructures. All of those reforms have contributed to reinforce the confidence of international and domestic investors and the incentives that have uh, been applied in India to bring in sort of investment to strengthen manufacturing, I think, are very, very potent. So all in all, I see that, uh, you know, international money will continue to look very favorably to India and other Asian markets like the one you mentioned. Okay. Uh, but I, I do want your thoughts on how global trade and uh, global economy itself will evolve. I don't know if you uh, saw the recent paper by the Credit Suisse strategist uh, Zoltan Pozar. He very strongly argues that uh, from 1990 up until perhaps, uh, you know, 2015, we had a period when the great powers trusted each other. And therefore, you know, there was distribution of uh, production manufacturing centers. We saw inflation coming down. But now there is distrust. It is French shoring or, you know, near shoring or on shoring of manufacturing. Uh, when there is so much distrust, the cost of manufacturing, he argues, is bound to go up because you're not seeking out the cheapest destinations. So he's arguing for a decade of inflation. Is that sounding convincing? Well, I think, I think this is a, a very complicated problem, and I think it goes... Um, beyond that in some directions. I'll try to explain that very, yeah. you know, uh, very briefly. The first has to do with uh, globalization, the fate of globalization. And while I don't think that we're going to go in a deglobalization mode, I think that there are some uh, sort of risks regarding fragmentation, some of which have already materialized, for example, in the technology space. So I think that that is going to create an environment which is different from the one we have in previous decades, which contributed to uh, uh, disinflationary forces and to growth forces in the global economy. So I think that in so far as there is some fragmentation, uh, there is going to be uh, more sort of an inflationary bias and, 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 and a negative uh, growth bias. So that's number one. Second, we have demographics. And there is the aging of, uh, of populations in many important parts of the world, certainly in the West, certainly in, in, in important parts of Asia. That is going to lead to uh, effects which may be both ways. As there is less supply of uh, working age uh, population, this is likely to lead to higher wages. On the other hand, as people get older, they're likely to become more conservative and vote for more conservative monetary and fiscal policies, which tend to tame inflation. So you're going to see forces moving in, in, in both directions. And number three, I think we have the digital revolution. And that is something which is going to put some disinflationary yes, pressures hopefully. and also provide some scope for productivity growth. So I think that the picture 
is, is slightly mixed. But if you feel that globalization may be the most important of these forces, then you would see, you would think that the disinflationary forces that we have had over the last couple of last few decades may not be there in the future. And therefore, this is going to be a more of a challenging environment for central banks, which, you know, whose mandate is to contribute to price stability and keeping inflation low. Yes, so we live in interesting times. Oh, well, I, actually, I, I didn't bring forth a very important uh, issue, climate. Uh, and now we're all into sustainable financing. The Indian government is thinking of uh, sovereign green bonds. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, will, uh, will we be able to strike a whole new area of sovereign bonds? Are they likely to be uh, having higher yields or lower yields? How do you see this entire issue of uh, uh, sustainable financing. Yeah, I think sustainable finance is extraordinarily important for the world and particularly for emerging markets and developing economies because this is where the impact of climate change is going to be felt the most yes. and this is where most investment is needed and therefore more financing. And certainly we have produced a report called Just in Time where we look at the financing needs of eight top emerging markets in the world and we judge that emerging markets uh, would need, those emerging markets would need about um, $100 trillion of uh, financing between now, sustainable financing between now and the end of 2060 trillion. in order to meet uh, net zero commitments, okay? That's about the size of global GDP. But, you know, emerging markets and developing economies don't have that money on their own. So there needs to be a contribution from the private sector and there, need to be, there needs to be international capital flows moving from developed markets into emerging markets and developing economies. And Standard Chartered, as a global bank, acts as a bridge for that. And we are sitting in many places, you know, like London, like New York, like Singapore and Hong Kong, where the money is. And we need to make sure that money flows from international financial centers to the countries that need it the most. So this is incredibly important. And I think that the role that the private sector can play in financing sustainability is absolutely of the essence. Because if that happens, then emerging markets and developing economies will be able to experience both the net zero uh, you know, transition to net zero and positive uh, impact on economic growth. While if emerging and developing countries are left to themselves, they are unable to, they will be Absolutely. unable to cope with, uh, uh, you know, with both net zero and the requirements of continuing to grow and develop. But, but do you see so much, uh, uh, you know, realization of the need for this transfer of resources? Because, you know, it was such a felt need that created the WTO and deglobalization. But uh, now, with the first whiff of war, the green uh, goals have been pulled back because, you know, the Ukraine war created uh, energy crises in every country. So do you think the world is sufficiently committed to pursue green goals and sustainable yeah. finance? I think that even more than before, because the awareness now is, for example, that fighting climate change and getting energy security go hand in hand. Okay. So people have seen new dimensions. And in the West, for example, in Europe in particular, the commitment towards a sustainable uh, source of energy, uh, green renewables, is become even more important. So I think that's moving in the right direction. The United States, I see it's a little bit more complicated. It, it's, it's perhaps not moving so strongly, but certainly I can see that in Europe. And, you know, going around our markets, I can still see tremendous determination on the part of many governments to continue with their plans for transition and to work hand in hand with the private sector, international banks like us, in order to make sure we can make that process happen. Okay. Well, I have uh, another unrelated question, but something which you, with your experience in IMF, will perhaps be better placed to uh, speak on. Uh, do you think there will be a lot of non-dollar bilateral uh, settlement of trades? Uh, you know, we are talking about uh, Singapore's pay now getting integrated with India's UPI and some transfer of payments. At least India is working towards it. This is at a very retail level. But uh, do you think for maybe digital reasons and for other reasons, it is possible that we will have bilateral settlement of trade in non-dollar 
uh, currencies. Probably also because, you know, uh, Russia's reserves were taken away for a whole host of reasons and the development of digital currencies. Well, I think that the development of digital currencies and particularly of central bank digital currencies may be a new ball game, and that may contribute to more diversification in the sort of settlement currencies. But in the traditional analog world, Although I see a scope for, for some of that happening, I would think that the dollar would continue having an extraordinarily uh, large presence on those, on those settlements, cross-border settlements. So these things, as we know, only change uh, at very slow pace. So, you know, in terms of the international preeminence of the dollar, I think that uh, it would be there for a long time. Although I can see the world moving, especially in digital space, towards a more multipolar uh, sort of currency composition than what we're actually seeing in the analog world. Uh, you know, in the near term, we exaggerate the change, but maybe in the long term, uh, it will change the way we transact. Uh, yes, uh, can't take away your eye from the dollar at the moment. The index is at 110, so really at its strongest. Well, just a final question. How confident are you of global economic growth and global trade? Uh, we saw the best years for global trade in the 90s and in the first decade of this millennium. Uh, do you think the best has passed? Well, it, it's up, up to us, okay? It's up to governments and it's up to the private sector. And uh, one thing uh, which is important is that although a lot of uh, discussion uh, centers around, uh, you know, trade and the implosion of trade, etc., I will make the point that trade nowadays is still stronger than pre-pandemic. Okay, so I think that is important. And second, that yes, we're having some moderation of uh, global trade uh, growth, and the slowdown in manufacturing growth will tell us that this is going to last for you know quite a number of months still. But over the medium term, again, studies that we have made at Santa Charter suggest that global trade is likely to continue expanding over the medium term at significant uh, pace. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Vinels. It was a pleasure trying to understand uh, the global economy from your point of view. So whether it is China plus one, or whether it is uh, avoiding a recession through a soft landing, or avoiding uh, the worst of climate change, the future really is in our hands. That's his message. Thank you very much for watching this edition of Global Dialogues.